Hello, Internet. On May 1st of uh, 2023, sometime around 1430, Jordan Neely was killed on a subway car on the F line in Manhattan. This is a charged political event, or at least it's an event that's become political as various public figures have willingly or not chimed in early or late um, on the topic and have reached broader conclusions. And I thought I would make a video uh, talking about it, basically because I, at first I just wanted to sort out for myself what seems to be going on, what are my thoughts. I produce a lot of documents uh, just working out what I think about things. And this one seemed to have enough flesh on it that it could be made into a movie or into a video. And um, I also just really wanted to have a voice out there uh, approaching the topic with the nuance that uh, I hope I, I, I would bring to it. So let's first sketch out how we're going to talk about it. First, I'm going to provide some basic impressions of New York City and its subways as somebody who's been living in the city for uh, a little bit over a decade now. Then I'm going to uh, move towards talking about the narrow legal view. Remember that I'm not a lawyer. And I'm going to zoom in on the beginning of the event until its end, um, largely ignoring the broader context. And we're just asking how things went and how they should have gone in that span, giving everything that was already set in place at the, at the beginning. Next, we'll talk about the broader issues of him and his history. And then we'll talk about the societal big picture. But before we get in, into any of that, I want to note that we're a few days out from the event. I guess we're coming up on, we're about a week out from the event right now. We're relying on available information from uh, what I believe is one recording and some reporting that's based on the recording as well as uh, interviews with uh, some of the other people who are on the subway car. So some of the things that I say might uh, have to change uh, depending on what information we're missing right now that might come out later. I'm hoping that I'm approaching the potentially incomplete information in a reasonable way, but of course everybody thinks that what they make is reasonable. Uh, life is complicated that way and just in general in life we're always dealing with facts under determining reality. So in terms of the subway impressions I have over the little over 10 years that I've been here. I live in Manhattan. I used to live in Brooklyn. I take the subway at least several times a week, or at least I did before I ran into some current mobility issues. I have an injury and it makes it hard for me to walk right now. So I've been taking the subway less very recently, but I'm very familiar with the subway. I still take it. I just don't take it quite as often as I, I was before. For many, many years, I was taking it several times a, a, a day to get to and from work. Uh, so I've, I've been uh, been using the subway for a long time while I've been here. Of course, I uh, even before I lived in New York, I occasionally visited, took the subway then. But really, we're going to focus more on the recent-ish stuff, the way the subway's been since I moved here. So most subway cars are fine. And the subway is generally a safe and tolerable experience. It's effectively necessary for really getting around the city. You're not usually going to have a bad time. Like your average subway trip is uh, in, in New York is, is going to be perfectly normal, clean. You're not going to run into seeing, smelling, experiencing things that you shouldn't. Uh, th that's, that's the norm. There often is on any given train, one or more cars that have one or more homeless people sheltering on them. This shouldn't happen. Pe uh, people sheltering should, in my view, always be removed. Uh, but usually they just take up a lot of space, but they're asleep. They lie on the seats. They often bring a lot of food and junk with them with gigantic bags that cover part of the floor space. They often smell awful. Uh, reasonably often they have open wounds, possibly bare feet. Uh, there might be a little bit of like blood coming off of their feet. It's kind of disgusting. 
you're often off uh, you're often better off avoiding cars where they're present or possibly just avoiding the parts of the cars where you'd have to be too near them but the majority of the time uh, they won't bother you and usually you won't even see them awake occasionally you might even wonder if they're still alive like it's disturbing distressing and as i said it really shouldn't happen but it does uh and again it's it's not the norm but it's not rare then there's a bunch of other misbehavior on the subway system and yes i do consider sheltering on the subway as misbehavior but we're, we're not talking about that exactly there's a bunch of active misbehavior on the subway system from people who are not uh, not insane. There are people who jump turnstiles. There are people who think that the subway is a place for them to beg or dance or preach or sell things, sometimes charity sales. Sometimes people are looking for donations. These people should also, in my view, be uh, reliably escorted out of the system and banned if they keep it up. The break dancers in particular are a nuisance because they get quite threatening when people won't move out of the space they want to dance. They're not allowed to do that, but it's not really uh, stopped enough. Um, but we're not really talking about that either. And finally, what we are talking about is the minority of people that are severely mentally ill, who overlap significantly, but not entirely with the homeless. They often don't understand social norms, or maybe they're so lonely that they don't care. They'll ignore personal boundaries. They'll sometimes get in people's faces. They'll sometimes grab people. They'll sometimes uh, just bend around them and kind of act like they own the, the place. They'll stash their stuff under subway seats and not really get that the subway is there to move people around. It's not a home. You'll sometimes see them get into fights, often with each other sometimes with uh, normal people. Uh, very often they're continually swearing at people and being verbally threatening. Some of them are clearly not all right, but uh, just stick to themselves and you'll just hear them mumbling and waving their hands around, but they, they vary a lot. You'll definitely see them maybe once a week or so if you take the subway a lot. People generally avoid eye, con eye contact with them and try to steer clear of them when they can. That's generally the most sensible way to handle them. Um, but if they actually get in somebody's face or they lay their hands on somebody, the results are unpredictable. Sometimes other passengers will step in, sometimes not. Uh, but yeah, you'll, you'll see this category in a small percentage of your subway trips, maybe about 5%. As I write these notes, the last time I saw a mentally ill person was actually yesterday on the Q line. I was traveling from Brooklyn back uh, to, into Manhattan sometime around 19 o'clock. I was near a crazy guy who was taking up two seats. He had a big garbage bag spilling onto the floor in front of him, full of all sorts of stuff. Didn't really recognize everything in the, uh, really much of anything in there, although I wasn't really looking. He was one of those who was waving his hands around continually and saying things, but I kept my earphones on so I didn't hear. He was trying to get my attention and the attention of a whole bunch of other people. People were trying to ignore him as they should. He smelled bad, but not nearly as bad as you'll often encounter. And he was ripping tiny streets off of a soiled newspaper he had with him. Uh, it was uh, damp. I'm not really sure what from. I d don't think I really wanted to know. And he t uh, took these strips and kept on packing them into little grills, uh, the grills that are part of the window of the subway car or trying to get them in the underpinnings of the seat. He was leaning all over the place and just kind of arranging them here and there and, and all that. Uh, I eventually managed to sit down when some people left. Uh, again, with my ankle being what it is, I kind of need to sit. And unfortunately, I was sitting right next to him and he kept on like bending right into my space uh, to, to reach uh, under the seat that I was in, on, in the empty seat next to me. Uh, and then he would lean back and then tear new strips off of his newspaper. I got pretty tired of this quickly. I didn't really want to verbally interact with him, so I just shifted uh, one seat over so that I was directly blocking him from doing that. He got visibly frustrated. He got up and paced the car for a little bit and eventually started uh, bending down under other seats, sticking his little strips of paper in the underpinnings uh, of those seats, which angered the other passengers. But nothing really more came of it. Uh, 
at the end of the 30 minute ride, I reached my destination, I got off, was kind of disgusted and a bit weirded out. Um, I was a little nervous during the time that he might attack me or somebody else, but he didn't, at least not while I was there. That's often how these things go. Uh, and again, it, ideally you would have social workers that would swoop in and remove people who are like that. It doesn't happen, or at least it doesn't happen particularly often. You can report these things to the MTA and very occasionally they do things. Uh, but usually the problem with reporting anything is that uh, it takes too long to really solve the problem. And sometimes people, uh, sometimes they'll just get out of the car at, at some spot and get right back on another car. Um, uh, very often they just don't want to end up in the train yard where somebody will definitely come and uh, confront them. So it can be hard to really get the authorities to do anything about them. So getting back to the, uh, the case at hand of Jordan Neely, and we're going to talk about that narrow legal focused view. And again, I'm not a lawyer. I, I take law seriously, but I'm naturally going to be missing a lot of legal context and understanding of laws. Um, and my mastery of the facts is going to be incomplete. Uh, just want to get that out of the way. I'm not somebody who's super absolutely confident that I understand everything. Um, as I understand, Jordan Neely was one of those severely mentally ill people on the subway system. Apparently he was bothering people by ranting, begging, throwing trash at them, saying he was ready to die, and offering generic threats that he might hurt people on the train. Daniel Penny, a former Marine, uh, after uh, seeing and suffering some of this, grabbed him from behind, put him in a chokehold for reportedly about 15 minutes. He was warned to stop by another passenger citing a worry about uh, death, but by that time Neely was already fast on his way to death. They tried to put him in a recovery position, but it didn't work, and uh, eventually he, uh, he was rushed off to a hospital, but he was dead by the time he got there. Those are the facts as I understand them. So the first question is, was the killing justified? And this is something that's going to be covered differently depending on how people, uh, who they sympathize with. Um, it's really a matter for the courts to decide and verify. So I'm just offering an impression based on my understanding of the relevant possible criminal charges and the information as I have it. Uh, as far as I understand, it doesn't seem clearly justified. Generic threats to attack people uh, in a very general sense are probably not a line to clear self-defense, nor was the claim that he was ready to die sufficient to change that. It may make people more nervous though because uh, he was saying he had very little to lose and had desperation. Um, so if Neely had approached somebody in particular and, and uh, given them a reasonable belief, and note that the idea of reasonable belief is fairly involved, that's not a throwaway uh, phrase, it uh, passed criteria. But if he gave somebody a reasonable belief that they uh, might or would be attacked, uh, that'd be a different story. And if more details come to light of this kind, then we need to revise uh, how we're seeing this. Um, Perry's response was also probably disproportionate, going well beyond what's necessary to subdue Neely or dissuade him, if even that were justified, which uh, I don't think it was. A chokehold is dangerous. It's naturally dangerous. A lot of people have been killed by them. A long chokehold is beyond uh, dangerous. So while Neely was acting in a generically threatening way, the threats not being specific and not creating an obvious need or justification for Perry to initiate force means that Perry's use of force was disproportionate and dangerous. And based on my understanding of the relevant New York laws, uh, given that uh, Perry presumably never intended to kill, uh, a charge of second degree manslaughter is the one that's most likely to stick in court. And I think it makes sense to charge, uh, uh, to charge, uh, charge him. So let's step back a little bit and talk about Jordan Neely because there have been efforts uh, to paint him as all sorts of different things. On one hand, you have uh, people, particularly family, uh, and I'm not, I'm not blaming family for preferring a narrative, pushing him as an innocent, uh, harmless, 
uh, perhaps even charming victim. Uh, families are naturally going to have a more friendly view to their members. And when you raise somebody, you're going to be emotionally attached. Uh, you, uh, I think that they're wrong, but you're not going to, I can't blame them for it. Um, so there have been efforts to paint him as, as a harmless uh, figure. Uh, to create one of these simple narratives uh, of uh, aggressor and victim. And this is not given my understanding accurate. Uh, I am relying on a variety of investigative uh, journalism that's been done since the case, but Neely had a very rough childhood with deeply traumatic effects, housing instability, severe drug problems, including addiction to particularly dangerous drugs, many arrests, and uh, he had assaulted several people. The justice system did not jail him as appropriate due to one of those alternative to incarceration programs, which in some cases are the right thing, uh, but they're over applied. In this case, it was clearly not the right thing. There was also an open warrant for his arrest at the time of his death. Um, like anybody, he had some bright points in his life, but in general, his life was a tragedy. Moving on to the big picture, we encounter problems in policy. One of the main uh, difficulties with current attitudes towards m both mental health and policing is that in the tension between support, punishment, and neglect in uh, how we structure these things, our society currently uh, heavily steers towards neglect. Some of this is out of a concern towards human rights. Some of it is misguided progressivism. The criminal justice system, as noted above, gave him an alternative to incarceration in past crimes that they really shouldn't have. The mental health system is presently very reluctant to involuntarily commit dangerous people, and in this case, uh, they clearly should not have been reluctant. He should not have been out in the general public with his issues, and he was already on the radar with social services for being on a uh, list of people of most concern more broadly, the MTA is shamefully reluctant to remove problem people from its system, which is bad for both regular passengers who are just trying to get around the city, and often bad for the problem people. And while I don't think in this case the violent subduel was justified, uh, given Neely's past assault on other passengers, including a violent but non-deadly... Uh, I'm sorry, a... Uh, 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 including a, an assault on uh, a 67-year-old woman where he broke her nose and a bone inside her skull. Uh, a, a violent but non-deadly subdual could have easily, easily been justified in one of the other uh, cases where Neely attacked, uh, well, uh, in, one of the, uh, in one of the cases where Neely actually did attack somebody. So again, to clarify, because I stumbled over words there a little bit, in this case, I don't think the, uh, I, I think the subduel was not justified and it was excessive. But in previous cases where Neely did attack people, some form of subduel, not this form of subduel, but some form of subduel could have been justified. So with better policy, this kind of thing should be quite rare. It probably can happen when things fall between the cracks, even with really good policy, but a mix of police and social services and whatever mix should result in the rapid removal of people on the subway who should not be there. There are still issues with uh, dangerous, mentally ill people like Neely out on the streets, and there are more policy failures there, and those are much harder to solve. In, in my view, deinstitutionalization went way too far and our current reluctance to reverse it is making the general public accept dangers and unpleasantness that they shouldn't have to accept, particularly if we're trying to get people to use public transit, and, and we should be trying to get people out of cars onto public transit. We can't really do that very well when we just say, but you have to accept uh, all this stuff. But more specifically though, people should generally, uh, generally be very reluctant to initiate force against others. And when they do so, they need to understand the dangers of initiating force against others and be proportionate and to not do things that are particularly dangerous when they have another choice. Shoving people away and warning them or just yelling at them, and I've yelled at crazy people a few times on the subway, that's, that's often enough. 
chokeholds are incredibly dangerous. Uh, we, uh, we can't have people broadly comfortable with doing dangerous vigilante responses to crazy people who are just hollering. Uh, and finally, we should resist the urge to pretend people with a history of severe mental illness, assault, and threatening behavior are lovable angels. This really is a situation where everybody screwed up really badly. There are no heroes here. There are no noble victims here either. There's just tragedy. So those are my thoughts on, uh, on the killing of Jordan Neely.